Welcome to the Future Tech edition of the Finding Genius podcast. Forget frequently asked questions, forget common sense, common knowledge, or Googling for information. How about advice from a genius in their field instead? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are the geniuses of their profession. Richard has made it his life's mission to interview the geniuses of their fields in areas such as AI, 3D printing, quantum computing, blockchain and Bitcoin, and more. Don't miss out on amazing podcasts with geniuses. Review us on iTunes or wherever you listen and go to futuretech.findinggeniuspodcast.com and subscribe today. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius podcast. I've interviewed uh, over 2,000 people the past three years, you know, uh, clinicians, researchers, scientists, etc. It's my goal to find the geniuses in the different fields and bring them to listeners. So uh, I have a great guest today, Professor Richard J. Johnson. Um, he's at uh, University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, he's authored a number of books. Uh, there's The Fat Switch. There's The Sugar Fix. And we're going to be talking about um, obesity, sugar, uh, metabolic health, those kind of issues. So, Rich, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm delighted to be on your show. Yeah. Well, tell me, what, uh, what got you into looking at uh, metabolic health and, and what's your, your research and your, your work about? All right. Well, um, I've been doing research for many years. Uh, I'm a kidney specialist, and I started off by studying kidney disease and high blood pressure, which is thought to be a, a problem of the kidneys getting rid of salt. And in the process of studying these, I came into um, studying metabolic syndrome and the role of uh, nutrition and particularly of sugar. And our work focused early on on fructose, which is a component of table sugar and high fructose corn syrup. And we be kind of became experts on that field uh, and helped try to figure out what it was special about fructose that could lead to obesity and diabetes. Okay, so, you know, I know a lot of people think of sugar as glucose, but I guess table sugar is what, a mixture of uh, glucose and uh, fructose or sucrose? Or you know, yeah. Tell me a little bit about the basics of sugar, first of all. Yeah, sure. So sh- sugar, or table sugar, the white sugar that we put on food, is uh, sucrose. And that is actually two sugars bound together. There's a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule, and they're bound together. And uh, the fructose is the sweeter of the two. Uh, And, uh, you know, we love sugar because uh, we like both the glucose and the fructose. We, they both activate the sweet taste receptors and give us a little pleasure response in our brain. Uh, The other big sweetener that's used out there is called high fructose corn syrup It's from corn. And they treat, they, they uh, treat the corn uh, syrup to generate a mixture of fructose and glucose. So it's the same type of uh, thing as table sugar. It's a mixture of fructose and glucose, but they're not bound together. And there tends to be a little bit more fructose than uh, glucose uh, in the syrup. And that makes it a little bit sweeter. And people tend to prefer that. And and, uh, because it's liquid, it can be mixed into foods very easily. And so uh, you High fructose corn syrup is gets into lots of foods. Like seventy percent of our foods, processed foods, have have high fructose corn syrup in it. And so these are the two major sweeteners together. They make up, you know, maybe fifteen twenty percent of our diet comes from sugar added. Yeah, these sugars. So what, uh, you know, when you do you see patients, or did you for a while and did you stop? Like, what's your clinical practice look like? Oh, I'm a workaholic. Richard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have an active patient uh, clinic. I have clinics and I see patients mainly with kidney trouble or with high blood pressure, but I, I do pretty much all general medicine as well. And then I, I have a very big research program. I've published hundreds of papers actually over the years and um been funded by the National Institute of Health and the Department of Defense and in a, a number of places. So I, I'm a, I keep myself busy. Oh, yeah. Well, I've spoken to uh, 
a lot of people about the effects of sugar, and not that I don't want to speak about that, but since you're a kidney specialist, there's it's much rarer that there's people out there that know about that. So how does sugar uh, play into kidney disease and high blood pressure? Well, it's a big story. Um, you know, so sugar uh, is a risk factor. Sugar intake it's not just a risk factor for um, obesity and diabetes, but it's a risk factor for kidney disease uh, and a risk factor for high blood pressure. And actually, it's a risk factor for many, many types of diseases. And um, w- w- our group uh, has done some work on, on the um, history of fructose and, and uh, how, it, how it works and, and why it does what it does. And it's sort of interesting. It, it uh, originally was a, a, a sugar. It's in fruit and, and honey. And originally, uh, it, its actions were really to help animals survive. And so uh, fructose was really a good guy for a long, long time. And so uh, many, many, many animals rely on fructose as a, as their way to protect themselves, like from hibernation during hibernation when during winter when there's no uh, food around, they'll eat sugar or fructose in particular in the fall to put fat on to help protect them, and they'll even become insulin resistant uh, by eating fructose to protect them because when you become insulin resistant, the glucose uh, in the blood goes up and that provides a fuel for the brain because normally. Uh, the muscles want the glucose and, and the brain wants the glucose and the liver wants the glucose. But if you become insulin resistant, the, the muscle can't take the glucose up so well. So it goes to the brain. So it's sort of insulin resistance is a protective response. And so it turned out that sugar and fructose in particular used to have a, uh, be, be more of a survival factor for animals. And, uh, but when you eat tons of it, it goes from being a survival factor to actually driving a lot of diseases. So that's, um, you know, it, so obesity and diabetes are just two manifestations of high sugar intake, but you, you can get kidney disease, you can get fatty liver and cirrhosis. Um, it probably has behavioral effects. Um, it, uh, it has a, a wide variety of actions that are not good. Um, and it's, and it's, it's ironic because it was meant to be a good pathway. And that's why we are so sensitive to sugar is because we actually, uh, there was times in our past when we, when we utilized fructose as a survival factor, but now, now it's, uh, kind of bad news for us. So uh, how much sugar in an average person's diet do you think is, uh, safe and how much are people having in your uh, estimation? Well, the diet uh, varies, and, and uh, if you're a teenager uh, or a um, young adult, uh, it's not uncommon at times for some of for some people to eat a, one fourth of their diet as sugar. Um, especially soft drinks, they can have so much sugar. You know, a soft drink can have the equivalent of ten to twelve teaspoons of sugar in one drink, and um, and you don't, you have no idea how how much sugar is in these is in some of these foods, and so it it, it can make up um, a, maybe a, up to a quarter of the diet in some people. Um, that's a lot. So uh, there was a j- just to give you an idea um, in uh, seventeen hundred, the average person ate four pounds of sugar a year, and in eight, eighteen hundred was eighteen pounds. And in 1900, it was 90 pounds of sugar in a year. And now we're eating like 150 pounds of sugar a year. That's, that's a lot of sugar. Yeah. So, yeah, so some, some people are eating half a pound of sugar a day, you know, but um, it's, it's a lot. So for, for simple math, uh, a pound is what, 454 grams? Yeah, I think that's right. So some people are eating 220 grams of sugar a day, you think? Yeah, there's there's probably some people eating that much. Yeah. <laughs> how much? How much do you think the? Uh, I don't know. The average uh, adult is having a day. What's your estimate? Oh, I, I'd have to pull up. 
all the papers, but it's, um, I would say, uh, probably uh, 300 calories a day of sugar. So that'd be uh, maybe 70, 75 grams or so. Hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's but, but there, you know, if you go to Dairy Queen, you can yeah. eat a dessert that has 70 grams of sugar in it. <laughs> In one in one big swoop. Well, what's some of the what's some of the nuance of sugar? Is there anything about it that isn't so bad? You know, if you're eating a lot of sugar, but it's all from fruit, is that so bad? You know, there, is there anything you can do to uh, to modulate? Yeah, just, you know, if you just love sugar and you want it, would it, anything you can do? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing is uh, um, natural fruits. Okay, they have fructose in them they're sweet they if you like really have that craving you want to eat something sweet on natural fruits many of them have a small amounts of sugar relative to like a soft drink so they may have like four to eight grams of sugar like a apple might have eight grams uh strawberries may be you know like four grams for a serving five grams and uh and there that turns out to be healthy and and what's good about it is it's not the the sugar in it the sugar is the sugar no matter what the fructose is fructose but um but in the natural fruits there's a lot of good things there's like fiber vitamin c uh a lot of things called flavanols and antioxidants uh there's many many different compounds and a lot of those neutralize the fructose in fact, we've done studies where we've looked at the different components in fruit, and a lot of them will neutralize, especially like vitamin C actually partially neutralizes the effects of fructose to cause uh, uh, fat storage. And so uh, if you eat a few few natural fruits a day, when you're that, that turns out to be pretty healthy. Now, if you eat a lot of fruit, like uh, especially if you uh, – you know, put it in a blender and make a juice and it, you get rid of some of the fiber and, and just drink the, the, the liquid, uh, then you get a lot of sugar at one, in one big swoop. You know, you can, uh, you could get 20 grams, like an apple cider, for example, will have about as much sugar as a soft drink. And then in that case, you don't get the benefit. So the pediatric society has, figured out that fruit juice isn't so healthy for children. And so there, you need to limit fruit juice in children and it's associated with obesity. And it's the same for adults. Fruit juice and fruit drinks are associated with diabetes and obesity. And also dried fruit, because when you dry, even though it tastes so good, you know, those dried apricots and, you know, how much we love those dried fruits, but they, they get rid of a lot of the good things and you're left with the sugar. So uh, if you want something that's healthy, that has sugar, uh, take a natural fruit, but don't drink any liquid sugar. Liquid sugar is a, a bad thing because um, the way the, the sugar works, the way fructose works to cause uh, obesity is when you eat fructose, it drops the energy inside the cell. It's the only nutrient, Richard. It's the only, only nutrient that when you eat it, your energy level goes down before it goes up. And so normally when you eat a nutrient, you want the energy to go up so you can do all the things you want. If you eat glucose, your energy goes straight up. You know, you, you make energy from the moment you eat it. But when you eat fructose, it's the only nutrient that actually drops the energy in the cell. It's like an alarm alarm clock. It's like an alarm system. And when that alarm goes off, when the, the energy falls, the body says, we're in trouble. We got to eat. We got to get, we got to put food on. We got to, we got to prepare for a disaster. We got to become insulin resistant to protect the brain. You know, we have to raise our blood pressure to keep our blood pressure up. We have to activate our inflammation system so we can protect ourselves. And that's great when you're uh, an animal in the wild and you get some of those fruits and honey and stuff like that. You do that, it's actually a survival mechanism that helps you. But if you eat tons of sugar, 
the inflammation turns into uh, risk for heart disease and hardening of the vessels. The increase in blood pressure suddenly becomes hypertension. The insulin resistance suddenly becomes diabetes. The fat stores suddenly become obesity. And man, suddenly you're, you're like in trouble. And, you know, uh, fructose has some other effects that like um, animals use it to reduce their oxygen needs. There's a, there's a mole rat. I don't know if you ever heard of him, the naked mole rat. This, this little guy uh, lives a long time, actually, and he burrows in the, in the, in the mud. And he burrows deep, actually, he burrows deep into these little burrows where it's, there's no oxygen. And you put a little mouse in there and the mouse will die because there's so little oxygen. But he does well. And the way he does it is he starts making fructose. And when he makes the fructose, it actually protects him from the low oxygen. It's a survival fact. But guess what? Cancer cells, when they uh, are spreading around the body, they uh, they initially don't have any oxygen because when they get into the when they get to a tissue they don't have much blood vessels to them they have to create yeah. it so they right. they're living in a low oxygen state so guess what they found out in the last few years guess what is the favorite fuel for breast cancer for colon cancer for liver cancer for pancreatic cancer guess what their favorite food is fructose, fructose. yeah because the fructose helps them because it decreases their need for oxygen and they, oh, they, they, uh, uh, and, and they want, and, and in order to live in that setting, they, they, they're in a low oxygen state. So it's the perfect fuel. So it, it isn't that sugar, sugar doesn't cause cancer. Sugar is feeds cancer. So it's just, uh, it's, I, okay. So, so I guess cells undergo what's called what oxidative phosphorylation, but they're using yeah. glucose as their normal pathway but yeah. yeah the way you should view it is uh the um you're making energy most of the time th- through energy factories called mitochondria and we have all this machinery producing energy in our body and uh and the professional place where it's done is the mitochondria and they're kind of like the factories pouring out energy but they require oxygen to produce that energy There's an old primitive system called glycolysis, which is uh, where they make energy. You don't need oxygen. It doesn't make as much energy. Well, fructose tends to want to shift down, turn down the factories and turn up the glycolysis. And it does it for a purpose. It, it, It wants to decrease the metabolism. And if you're producing, if, if the, everything turns down, it, it actually helps the animals survive. You know, it's like uh, surviving in hibernation. You know, it's surviving. You have to kind of turn down the system so you don't burn off all the fuel. And, and one, of the, one of the big, you, you just have to cut back on your big factories and you switch to more primitive ways to make energy. And so f- this fructose is used by all these animals uh, as a way to help them survive uh, and or extreme conditions. And actually, even in our, uh, our history, we, we, we've at least twice almost went, humans almost went extinct, or our ancestors did, and we, we relied on this system to help us survive. And, um, and, but now, we've trained ourselves, we're sensitive to sugar, we've gotten really sensitive to sugar, and and uh, we've learned how to make it, and uh, we, we don't know how to regulate it. And so we just keep eating it, and, uh, and we get hooked on it. And, uh, and now all of these things that were once good are killing us. So, so does our body um, change glucose to sucrose to fructose, or does it produce fructose on its own under certain conditions? Yeah, it does. So we, we actually we had a paper in... Uh, in a nature journal where we showed that the way high glycemic carbs work, uh, the way that a high glycemic carb makes you fat and diabetic is because it's not the starch itself, but when you eat potatoes and chips and rice, they raise the glucose in the blood a a little bit, and that stimulates in the liver the production of fructose. And if you block the fructose from being produced in the liver in an animal, then glucose doesn't cause obesity or diabetes. It causes a little bit of weight gain, but it, 
mainly it won't cause diabetes or fatty liver. So the diabetes and fatty liver from sugar isn't from the glucose. It's from the fructose. Why the, glucose would, uh, gets, the glucose gets turned into fructose. But why, why would your body uh, produce fructose? What, 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 what's the function? Why does it do it? Well, because we were, we, we, there was a time in our past when we were struggling to survive. Mm. And uh, I've actually studied this. So um, there are different, different periods, but uh, we almost went extinct 15 million years ago. Uh, uh, and I don't know if you want me to tell that story, but I'd be happy sure, to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, so, so one of the things that fructose makes is uric acid. And, and glucose does not make uric acid, but fructose does. And, uh, and the way it does is when fructose drops the energy in the cell, the energy, which is called ATP, gets broken down to uric acid. And so you produce this uric acid. And this is why uh, sugar can cause gout, because uric acid uh, is, when it crystallizes in joints, causes gout. Hmm. But, but uric acid also has bio, biological properties. And... Uh, and so uh, one of the things that uric acid can do is uh, uh, it, it and s- some of its products can actually stimulate fat production in the liver and uh, in the body. And so it turned out that uh, humans have much higher uric acid than, uh, than most mammals. And, it's, and it makes us more sensitive to the effects of sugar because when you uric acid, acid goes up, uh, you respond to sugar with a much more prominent fat response. And, uh, and so uric acid is a way to, uh, to amplify the effects of sugar. So if I give an animal a slug of fructose and its uric acid is high because I've manipulated it, it will put on more fat for the same dose of fructose than if the uric acid's low. Is it, is it a vicious circle? So exposure to fructose seems to raise uric acid, what you're saying. And then once you're in a high uric acid state, that makes it more conducive to producing more fructose or oh, yeah. storing it. Yeah, making more fructose as well as responding to fructose. This is why people with gout often are overweight uh, and diabetic uh, because the uric acid feeds into it. So interestingly, there was a time when we, our uric acid levels were low. And this was like millions of years ago. And there was this, um, you know, uh, in evolution, there, the, around 20 million years ago, uh, the first ape appeared in Africa. And this, these were undifferent from all the monkeys and stuff. These guys were, had big heads, big brains, and uh, they were tailless. And uh, back then, there were... Europe, I mean, excuse me, uh, Africa, where these apes were, uh, they were living mainly on fruit, and they were quite su- successful, many species. And then uh, global cooling started to occur around 15 million years ago. And uh, as, as the world cooled down, the water levels uh, in the oceans fell, and Africa, which at that time was an island, suddenly had land bridges to Europe. And a lot of these apes and giraffes and elephants and rhinos and anteaters and all kinds of animals crossed the land bridge into Europe and Asia. And then uh, they continued to live on fruit in Southern Europe. And, um, and the, it was still tropical and, uh, and they had fruit all year round. And then as it got cooler and cooler, the apes up in, uh, in Europe started to die out. But there was this very interesting finding. There was a mutation that occurred right around then that affected uric acid and, and, and it made, made all these apes have a higher uric acid. And uh, that mutation occurred right around that time. And, and we figured out that the mutation actually increased the response of the apes to, to, to fruit that they could make more fat from fruit. And uh, it turned out that um, these apes were starving because of global cooling because the fruit trees started to die out. And, and uh, the apes in 
herbs started going extinct. But uh, when the mutation occurred, what happened was it was it allowed them to survive on the very low levels of sugar fruit that were available. And then some of them actually made it back to Africa and also to Asia, where they went on to develop into the great ape, but also into humans uh, in a separate lineage. So we we actually resurrected the extinct gene, and I worked with anthropologists uh, from um, you know that were experts on this type on, on this period, and we we had several papers. We even had one in Scientific American not long ago about this uh, this mutation that increased. We, it's called the fat gene because um, when you got this mutation, you could you could become much more sensitive to sugar. So. So, so, uh, so it had that advantage that at the time it helped us survive because, uh, you know, basically our ancestors were, were, were uh, starving to death. And then uh, mm-hmm. with this mutation, we were able to make it through. And, uh, but then now we're susceptible to gout because we have higher uric acids and we're more susceptible to, uh, you know, more sensitive to the effects of sugar. So when we eat a lot of sugar, we get a bigger response. So if you get, if you take a mouse and you give it a lot of sugar, it will get fat, but you have to give it a ton of sugar. But if you give the same kind of a a relative amount for the weight of the mouse, if you give that to a human, you're going to see major effects. We, we are more sensitive to sugar than most animals. We like sugar. I like sugar. I don't know. Do you like sugar, yeah. Richard? Yeah. Well, I'm drinking a coffee as I talk to you, and it has some sugar in it. Oh, go. there you go. <laughs> so what, what do you tell people, with all your knowledge, what do you tell people clinically then? What's the uh, the message from you that's different or more effective for people? I know everyone's different. Well, so. I, I've got, we've done a lot of work, but one, uh, one, one thing I can tell you is we've kind of, uh, we, we figured out that, the, that part of the way she, sugar works is to stimulate a hormone that makes you um, want to hold on to water. And um, it turns out that that hormone, which is called vasopressin, uh, also tries to drive fat production. And the way, the reason is, is when you make fat, you actually are not just storing energy, but you, you're sort of like storing water because when you burn fat, you produce water. And, uh, and so it turns out that like whales, for example, they, they get real fat because they don't drink salt water. And when they break down the fat, they make fresh water from the fat. And they also get fresh water from the food they eat. And animals in the desert uh, also use fat to produce water uh, when, when there's not much water around. So it turns out that, uh, that sugar drives up this hormone that makes you want to hold onto water. And it's partly because people who are overweight tend to be dehydrated. And there's, uh, we did some studies where we gave water and found that if you drank a lot of water, you could suppress a lot of these pathways. And so the the basic message that's kind of a nice one is um, the old wives tale that if you drink eight glasses of water a day, it helps you not get fat is actually true. And so uh, if you want to take some pounds off, uh, you know, try to cut back on sugar, try to drink about six to 10 glasses of water a day, and that'll help you. So that's my little ending message, I guess. So yeah, you know, uh, you, you've got some water in that coffee cup, just got to take the yeah. sugar out. Yeah. What's um, I mean, any big levers on what people can do to, to help themselves? You know, let, do you run into you know, patients, for instance, that just seem to be incredibly resistant to losing weight, and if so, any insights into those kind of people's circumstance? The first thing is you got to find out what your kryptonite is. So what, what you got to do is you got to have them talk to you about what they like to eat and what's their favorite food and what do they tend to, are they a, a nibbler? Do they, what are they eating between meals? What, do they, what is their kryptonite? Because they're probably getting something that's uh, either got sugar in it or it gets turned into sugar in the body. So that's the first step. And then you kind of, you know, you do the, all the usual stuff. Tell them to, you know, try to avoid liquid sugar, uh, try to drink more water. But, uh, you know, 
one of the things is to try to find out if they have a particular food that they're eating and try to help them uh, get off that and, and uh, try to figure out how to block craving. There are different, different things you can do, but um, you know, like taking the natural fruit, artificial sugars, you know, uh, none of us like artificial sugars, but um, they do for the most part, they, they can help, can help a person in the acute phase from uh, trying to get off sugar. Um, and then uh, intermittent fasting does work. Um, you know, there's lots of different techniques, actually. Okay. I, I know that uh, there's been a debate on, let's say, diet sodas or, you know, fake sugar or, you know, non-natural sugars. Um, do you have any insights on that? Do you think that oh, they're yeah. uh, harmful or not harmful and why? Yeah, sure. So we've actually done a lot of studies with diet sugars. And um, for the most part, the, the first rule is that um, sugar is a lot, lot more powerful at driving f- fat and so forth. And, and diet sugars don't do that in the animal. They're, they're, most of the, uh, there's one exception, saccharin. Um, does have a little bit of effect to cause a little insulin resistance through uh, its effects on the gut. Um, but mo- for the most part, artificial sugars do not cause obesity. They do not cause diabetes. Um, here's a good example. If you knock out the sweet receptor uh, so that an animal can't taste sweet, you give it sugar, it will still love sugar, even though it can't taste it, and it will still get fat. But if, uh, artificial sugars, they don't care for artificial sugars once you knock out the sweet receptor. But even if you give a lot of artificial sugar to an animal, they won't get fat. So the artificial sugars are not causing um, obesity. There's there are a couple exceptions. There's this, uh, you know, like the low sugar ice creams and stuff that have sorbitol, low sugar syrups. Sorbitol, maltitol, these, these uh, sweeteners can be converted to fructose in the body, a little bit of them. So they're, 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 it's sort of like eating one half the strength of fructose. So it's a little better than, than eating sugar, but uh, you're still getting sugar. But most of these things like Splenda, Stevia, um, you're, not getting, uh, you're not getting the, the obesity or diabetes type of effect. Having said that, you know, a lot of these um, artificial sugars have uh, substances that we don't necessarily think are necessarily good for you. So um, uh, Splenda is, is a chlorinated carbon. Um, you know, uh, we don't really, it, it, it ha- it's been fairly safe in most testing, but everyone's a little bit worried about it. Aspartame, um, some <laughs> tiny bit of it gets converted to formaldehyde. That doesn't sound good. You yeah. know, the, I mean, so none of us are really excited about artificial sugars. We like to eat natural things. But um, but they're definitely safer than regular sugar when it comes to risk for obesity and diabetes. And if you're trying to get off sugar and you really desire something sweet and you can't, uh, you know, an, a, you can't eat a fruit, well, then maybe maybe a Diet Coke is okay as you try to wean off sugar. Okay, yeah, I got you. Um, any drugs that uh, are out there or ways to, to block production of uh, fructose in the body, at least partially? Yeah, there's a, I, I have to uh, c- confess that, um, you know, we, my, I have a little startup company and we're trying to make inhibitors for fructose and, uh, and we're moving along, but uh, other groups are moving along as well. And probably the company that has the most exciting uh, preliminary work is Pfizer and uh, uh, they have a drug that's uh, they're going to phase three now or phase two B maybe with their uh, fructose inhibitor. And in preliminary data, uh, preliminary studies in phase phase one and two, uh, they, they got some pretty good results uh, suggesting that it may really be beneficial for uh, preventing diabetes and fatty liver and all that kind of stuff. So I, it, it's they're coming. Okay, well, that's great. Yeah. Well, Rich, what's what's the way ba- what's the best way for people to get in touch? Maybe to uh, you know read through the hundreds of papers you've written, or you know at least uh, start on this. Start to start with getting some information. Well, uh, Richard, you know if they want to uh, go to 
Pub Med, I, I've written a number of papers that are kind of just general uh, knowledge papers for people who want to know about sugar. But I also have two books. I have a book called The Fat Switch that uh, really gives a nice overview of this whole thing. And, um, and that book is available through the Mercola website, but also through Amazon, Kindle. Uh, and I have uh, The Sugar Fix, which is a little bit older book, but it was the first book with a low fructose diet um, uh, from Rodell, you know, 2008, I guess. Um, and uh, you can Google. I have, I'm on YouTube a little bit. So uh, I was just on the P- Peter Adia's uh, podcast. Oh, really? Yeah, Peter's got a great podcast. It's cool. Yeah. So just on that. I have a, na- I'm in a National Geographic, uh, August 2013 issue cover story by Rich Cohen uh, and Scientific American. Uh, there's a, I can't remember when that came out, but yeah. Just, uh, okay. yeah, Richard, Richard J. Johnson. That's <laughs> all right. That's my sales pitch. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> Rich, thanks for coming. It's been a really good call. I appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Richard. It's nice talking to you and uh, I hope uh, you get that sugar out of the coffee. Will you? <laughs> Can I? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Take care. All right. You've been listening to the Future Tech Edition of the Finding Genius Podcast. This podcast is information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed. Review us on iTunes or wherever you listen and subscribe today by going to futuretech.findinggeniuspodcast.com.